said, good to have you here this morning. Thanks for being with us, uh, those of you in here. And then, of course, we have quite a few people that are still online with us. And so we're glad that you're hanging out with us this Sunday also. Uh, last Saturday night, uh, it was like any other night, went to bed. And uh, man, when my head hits the pillow, I'm out. Uh, my wife abs absolutely hates that about me, but uh, it's just the way my body functions. Now, the problem is when I wake up in the middle of the night, I have a hard time going back to sleep. And so last Saturday night, uh, I woke up about 2.33 in the morning. My mind starts churning. I'm thinking about church. I'm thinking about my message. I'm running through my message in, in, my, in my mind. And once I got bored with that, like probably many of you, I uh, started thinking about family, started thinking about life, started thinking about sports, and started thinking about the lottery. Because last Saturday, the lottery was up to about a billion dollars. Nobody won it last night, by the way. It's up to like $1.9 billion. But um, uh, last Saturday, it was up to $1 billion. I read an article before I went to bed, and it was talking about the lottery. And it said, hey, if you win, you don't really get a billion dollars. You get like $500 million. And, uh, and really, you don't get $500 million because you got to pay taxes. So you actually only get about $350 million. I'm like... Why would anybody want to win that much money, right? I mean, is it even worth it to buy a ticket if you don't get the whole thing? So I'm thinking through this, and then you know, probably like many of you, I'm like, okay, so you know, if I won just a measly little $350 million, what would I do with it? And I thought, well, we'd pay off some debts, or all our debts, and then we would um, help some family members out. We'd take a really nice vacation somewhere. And, and then probably again like you, we go to sort of this altruistic place. Like, what would I really do with this money? What good would I do? And I came up with a plan. Uh, my family and I would start the Simpkins Foundation. Uh, pretty sure there's not a Simpkins Foundation in the whole wide world, and so we'd be by ourselves. But we start this foundation. And for us, we love pastors and church planters and their families. And like, all right, we'd start this foundation, and we'd, we'd just do everything we can to pour into pastors and their families because they need it probably more than anybody else does. But the truth is... If you won that kind of money, would you really start a foundation? Or, or would we become more like Gollum and Lord of the Rings and, and just become this horrendous creature hoarding everything that we have? Well, today we're going to start a brand new sermon series called Change. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, this is a money series, okay? Uh, nobody laughed at that. I don't know why you guys wouldn't laugh at that one. It's a money series. Uh, if we didn't lose you last week because of the politics message we did, then we figured we'd prune the tree over the next three weeks as we talk about, as we talk about money. Uh, some of you come from churches and you're like, man, man, they talked about money all the time. That's all the church talks about. And, and that may be the church you came from, okay? And maybe you say, hey, this church talks about money a whole lot, which means you have been here about 20 minutes, Okay. Uh, you've never been here before because we rarely talk about money here. Uh, I've been the lead pastor for five years here at The Journey, and we've never actually done a money series. Uh, we, we've hit it every once in a while, but we've never done a full money series. So we're going to do that uh, over the next three weeks. Now, I, I, I do want to tell you this one thing. In this series, okay, listen to me. I'm not going to ask you to give more money to The Journey Church, okay? I'm going to make that promise to you. But what I hope happens over the next three weeks is that our perspective on money will change and also our minds and hearts too. Well, to talk about this topic, we're going to start by looking at a parable that Jesus teaches in Luke chapter 19. We find similar parables throughout the Gospels. Uh, this one is actually different than maybe uh, one we did in Matthew at the end of our story series at the end of the summertime. Uh, but what we, we see here, scholars say, well, this must have been a pretty important topic for Jesus because he talks about it quite a bit and has different parables that connect to it. So we're going to spend all of our time today in Luke chapter 19. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, we're going to put it up here on the screen. It starts with verse 11. Here's what it says. It says, the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was near Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. Now, this is sort of an interesting way to begin a, uh, a parable, 
Um, in fact, you look at those last two lines there in it, it seems kind of strange. The reality is Jesus is actually hitting on a historical event that had taken place uh, at about actually a few years before this. Um, Herod the Great had passed away in around 4 BC, but he left his kingdom and split it up between three of his sons, Herod Philip, Herod Antipas, and Herod Archelaus. Well, Archelaus was put in charge of the area of Judea, and that's where Jerusalem, uh, the holy city to the Jewish people, was located. Well, he had to actually go to Rome to have them confirm him as the ruler, but then to also give him the title of king. The Jewish people hated Archelaus. Uh, he was cruel. He was tyrannical. I mean, he was a terrible leader. Uh, at one point in time, he had actually massacred, had his soldiers massacre 3,000 Jewish pilgrims during the Passover festival. And so they didn't want this guy to be king. They didn't want him to be a ruler. So they sent 50 of their leaders. They sent this delegation to Rome to tell Augustus, Augustus, please do not make this guy the ruler of Judea. Don't make him the king. In the end, Augustus decided that Archelaus could lead, but he never gave him that title of king. He actually gave him the title national leader. That was what his title became. But he, but he never became king. And so as we read this right here, we're finding Jesus is actually pulling some of the historical events that had taken place that the Jewish people would have known to connect them with that. Now, that's not the reason Jesus is telling the story. He's not trying to make some political statement. He's not trying to confirm or affirm something in history. He's just using it as sort of a backdrop for this particular parable. Now, if we go to the story, what we find here, we've got this nobleman. He's going to go to this faraway place so he can become king. He's got these ten servants, and he gives each one of these servants two and a half years worth of wages and asks them to invest them. And when he comes back, he, he's going to see what they've done with this money. Verse 15. After he was crowned, maybe, maybe Jesus is rubbing it in a little bit. I, I'm not quite sure here. Uh, but but the, the king wants to know, okay, I gave you this money. I gave you these resources. How did you invest it? What did you get in return? And so as we look through here, we find that the servant, the first servant, takes that, those resources, takes that money, invests it, and actually comes back with a return on investments about 1,000%. You and I would like a return of investment of about 1,000%, wouldn't we? And well, the king loved that. The king's like, you are amazing. So I'm going to put you over charge of 10 cities. Next servant comes in, same thing happens here. He's like, well, how did you do? Well, I, I came back with 500% of my return on, on an investment you gave me. Again, you and I would love that. The king loved that. The king says, hey, I'm going to make you governor over five cities. And so the, these guys have invested their money well and come back and been able to give the king some good news. But then we hit the third servant, verse 20. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. We get to the third servant here, and the king's like, all right, what did you do with my resources? And this servant says, well, I hid them. In fact, some of your translations probably say that he stuck it in a napkin. Um, Jewish regulations in those days said if you were going to save something, you did not put it in a napkin. You actually would bury it and put it in the ground. And so here's this, this servant who's not even doing what he's supposed to be doing on all fronts. And the king asked him, what did you do with my money? He said, I, I hid it. Now, why did he hide it? Well, look at the motive there. He says he feared the king. The king scared him and he gave some reasons why here now we can read that and it sounds like this king is a mafia leader right but but he's a businessman and so if you think about a businessman he's, he's got other people that are working for them and they're doing the hard work and, and so this servant has kind of seen that and for some reason there's this fear that's encapsulated who he is and so he he hoards the money he hides the money well what's the outcome of his actions look at verse 22 says, you wicked servant, the king roared, your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. 
So the king looks at this third servant and says, hey, why didn't you use these resources I gave you? I, I gave these to you, and I said, invest this money. Use it somewhere. He said, why didn't you just even put it in the bank? Well, partly because they didn't have banks back then. Um, what, what the translation really is here is money lenders. They had money lenders. And so this, the servant could have given it to a money lender, and I don't know, got like 1.1% uh, return for that money that he was given. And so the king's like, why didn't you just do something with what I gave you? Well, then the king not only responds verbally, the king takes actions in verse 24. Then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. So the king says, you know what? Take that money from that servant right there, those two and a half years worth of wages, and I want you to give it to the, the servant who came back and made a thousand percent return on investment on my resources that I gave them. But I love that next little line there. What about the other servants? How did they respond? It said they were upset. They, they, they were mad but because of what the king had done. Like, why, why would you give the one with more even more when the king responds to that in our last verse here verse 26 yes the king replied and to those who use well what they are given even more will be given but from those who do nothing even what little they have will be taken away here's the king who says hey listen i gave every single one of you the exact same amount i told you to invest that money i trusted you with it and here's what i got in return and this particular person did way better than anyone else. That their return on this investment is so much more than everyone else. So I'm really going to trust them with the rest of these resources to do good with them. As we look at this particular parable right now, uh, right here, there are, there are many different paths we can take. Uh, there's many different themes that we could talk through about it. But I, I really want to take it at, at face value here uh, and talk about the, the resources here and, and how this played out in this story and how it connects with us today and how it goes back to the very beginning of the parable when Jesus is talking about this kingdom of God and how you and I are integral into to the kingdom of God here on this earth. Um, but let me start by asking you a kind of a strange, simple question. Who owns your stuff? Who owns your stuff? Uh, the Maasai Mara is an enormous reserve at the southern end of Kenya, and it kind of goes into the Serengeti of Tanzania. You can see it there on this particular, uh, particular map. And it's named after a tribe that lives there, the Maasai tribe. And, uh, and for them, everything that they have, everything that they own is, is all connected to cattle. So, so you don't go to them and say, how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, you, you talk about your net, net worth being about how many cattle you own. And so you go around like, hey, how many cattle do you own? Oh, you're really rich. You got a bunch of cattle. Hey, you're not because you don't have a bunch of cattle. Now, the interesting part about the Messiah people is that they believe that all the cattle in the world is their, theirs. It's all theirs. And all that's happened is that those cattle have wandered away. A buddy of mine is a pastor in Nevada, and uh, his church actually does missionary work with this particular tribe. And uh, he was sitting down with the chief of that particular tribe, this guy right here, a few years back. And he's asking him about this, and he says, okay, so if you come to America, all right, you come to America, what does that mean for all the cattle in America? And, and the chief tells him, he says, well, here's the deal. If I come to America, it is my job to wrangle up all of those cattle and to bring them back to their home here in Africa. We hear that and think, well, that's kind of strange. Because there's a lot of cattle and there's a lot of cattle owners. How can someone say that they own all the cattle? And, and oh, by the way, he probably doesn't know Psalm 5010. that says that the God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, right? And, and so how can you say that you own all the cattle. But I wonder, are you and I really any different than the Messiah tribe when it comes to what we have? 
Because so often we think to ourselves that I went to school, I got a really good job, you know, I work all these hours every single week, my company pays me for the work that I do, and I get paid well. I, I've listened to all my, my boss's cheesy jokes over all these years. I've laughed at every single one of them, and that's helped me climb up the company ladder. Um, everything that I have is mine. Everything that, that is in my possession is mine to do with it what I want to do with it. So I can spend it how I want to spend it. I can, I can keep it how, if I want to keep it. I can give it away if I want to give it away. Because all that I have is mine. And I wonder if we aren't really any different than this particular tribe when it comes to cows. Because when we look at the stuff we have, we have this is, this is mine attitude. And no one can do, tell me what to do with it. No one can take it from me. This is all mine. But I think that's the perspective that we need to change. As we start the series today, we need to change our perspective on what we have. That it's not ours that it's God. And especially if we're a follower of Jesus. If we're a follower of Jesus, th this means that for us, we have to understand that all that we have isn't ours. No matter how much we have, no matter how much we get paid, no matter how much we have saved, no, no matter how many possessions that you and I have, it's not ours, it's God's. That if we follow Jesus, all of our possessions, our stuff, our money, it belongs to God. And maybe for us, that's the change in perspective that we need to begin with. What would this look like? Well, for example, I want you to think about the home or the townhouse or maybe the condo that you own. Um, that land where your housing sits, it's God's. Even though your name may be on the deed, that's all God's. And the trees that were cut down to put your house there, those trees are God's. And the trees that were cut down to build your home, those trees are, are God's too. The rocks that were crushed to make the concrete for the foundation of your home, that's God's. The, the material that was used to, to make your appliances and your carpets and your furniture, all that's God's. Those little dust bunnies that somehow show up in those deep, dark corners of your house and underneath your couch, hey, you know what? Those are God's too. Everything that we have, everything we own, it's all God's. Just like the cattle on a thousand hills. But we have to get to this place where we release our minds from that. We get, have to get to this place where we get away from this is mine attitude and understand that God owns it all. And so if God owns it all, then that should mean something to us. If we're a follower of Christ, that should mean something to, to us. So let me kind of share a couple of ideas from this that I think are so important. The first one I would say is that God entrusts us with what we have. God entrusts us with what we have. Um, if you've got preteens right now or teenagers or if you've been through that stage before, you know they ask for a lot of money, right? Like lots and lots of money. Seems like every single week, every single day, they're asking for money. Now, if you're a good parent, I, I'm sure you don't say, well, sure, here's a big old pile of money. Go do with it whatever you want to do with it. That's not usually how we parent our kids. We usually ask a question, and the very first question is, what do you need this money for, right? What do you need this money for? I mean, these are children we love. We care for, we feed them, we give them a place to stay. They've been with us for years. And the first question we ask them when they ask us for money is, what do you need this money for? Now, why is that? It's because we want to know where our money's going. Can I be honest? I think it's because we don't fully trust them either, right? We don't fully trust them to make wise decisions with the resources that we would hand to them. At least, not quite yet. But if we go back to this parable, we see that here is this king. By the way, the king represents God. And, and this king gives his servants, these ten servants, the exact same amount of money and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this. This is yours. Do with it what you want to, but I would love to see you invest this money. And when I come back, I want to talk to you and, and see how you've done with it. 
But why would, it, why would this king do that? This king trusts the servants. This king says, here are these free resources. Take these free resources and do with it whatever you like. But let's see how you do with what I trust you with. See, God actually treats us differently than we tend to treat our teenage kids. We're like, hey, what is this money for? God's like, hey, here are these free resources. Let's see what you do with them. Which then leads us to the second piece here. God wants to see how we respond to what we've been given. God wants to see how we respond to what we've been given. In the story, again, uh, the king goes away, or the nobleman comes away, comes back a king. He's given all these resources to the servants. The, the servants are asked to, to, to invest it. And so they do. And so, you know, one's at 1,000%, one's 500%, one is 0% because that one hides it. And so what do we see here? We see that there are two really good investments and one really poor investment. Now, there's 10 servants. We don't know what happened to the other seven, uh, but we, we're just talk, told about these particular uh, these particular three servants. We know exactly what they did with their money. They responded to what the king had asked of them. The question for us is how do we respond to what we've been given? How do we respond to what we've been given? I'm going to to now go back to your teenage years, okay? And you remember like that first or second paycheck you, you got from your first job? Maybe one of you in this whole room took that money and invested it at 16, and you're probably a multimillionaire now, and we all wish we had done the same thing, but 99.9% .9 of us did not do that with our money, did we? Uh, we took that money, and um, we went right to McDonald's and spent it all. Uh, we went to the movies. We went to the gas station and got some candy and some Mountain Dews. We went to the mall and shopped at buckles or whatever the, the cool store was back in the day for you when you were a teenager so what we did we went through money like it was our job we made it and we spent it as quickly as we got it i don't think god is going to give us grief for the 16 year old us who blew through our cash okay and, and by the way i know there's probably some 16 year olds in here like hey invest my money awesome keep doing that very wise thing to do but most of us, we're beyond those teenage years now. And the responsibility that we have with what we, we own, or we think we own, uh, our possessions, our resources, our stuff, our, our money, is so much different. And God wants to see, again, if we're followers of Christ, God owns it all. God wants to see how are we using those resources? How are we investing the resources that we've been given? And I'm not talking about how are you investing in your mutual funds and stocks and 401ks? I'm talking about how are you using, how are you investing what you have to make this world a better place, to bring about the kingdom of God here on this earth? So how are we responding to what we've been given and what God entrusts us with? Well, it's a pretty simple way to figure out, right? I mean, all of us probably have... Um, online banking and now we can pull out our, our phones right now in this moment and we can open up our banking app and we can look through there we can scroll pretty quickly and we're going to get a really good idea how we use our resources aren't we we're, we're going to know very quickly how we are investing our money what's most important to us by looking at how we spend the resources that we've been given but i want you to do, do something about that i want you to think that now you're standing in front of the king and you've got your online banking open, and you've got to answer that question from the king, how did you invest my resources? What would your response be right there in that moment? And then after hearing the answer of how you invested those resources, what do you think the king's response would be to you? Or more appropriately, what do you think God's response would be to how you and I use and invest our resources. God entrusts us with the resources that we have, but God also wants to know how we respond to the resources that we have been given. Which then adds, it actually leads us back to the start of this parable. And there's a question that I think that you and I need to wrestle with 
when it comes to this parable, and it's this. Again, if we, if we follow Jesus, we believe in Jesus, and God owns, in a, God owns it all. Here it is. Would you view your resources differently if you accepted they weren't yours? Would you view your resources differently if you accepted they weren't yours? I was trying to figure out some next steps that, you know, I can say, hey, here's some next steps you can take. But I thought, you know what, we're going to make this super, super practical this morning. Uh, right now, we have some ushers. They're going to walk through the aisles. And right now, they're going to hand you a $5 bill, okay? So we'll have them go ahead and start doing that now. Every single person in this room gets $5. $5 bill. Yep, there you go. All of you online, you can come to second service and get your $5. <laughs> but you're not getting one. We're not Venmoing any money to you today, okay? This is hard, hard currency. All right, so they're handing out this $5 to every single person in this room. I want you to take that $5. And um, here's the deal. No one's getting any more than anybody else. Everybody's getting five. There's not a one in there. There's not a 10. There's not a $350 million bill in there. None of that kind of stuff. Everybody's getting a $5 bill this morning that's in the space. Now, here's what I want you to think about, okay? This is your free resource. You can use this money how you want to use it. Uh, you can spend it, right? You, you can uh, go buy like a very small cup of coffee because that's about what a small cup, cup of coffee costs today. Uh, you can go buy a lottery ticket. Yep, thanks. That was part of my joke. I appreciate that. By the way, if you win the lottery, you, you need to bring some back because uh, it's not technically your money, okay? Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want, I want you to just use it. How You can invest it. Maybe you're a day trader. You do penny stocks. Penny stocks, you could buy like a whole company for $5, right? So you do with it what you want to do with it. But here's, here's what I'm going to ask you, okay? This is yours. You can give it away. What I'd like for you to do is next Sunday or the following Sunday when you come back, we're going to have a little offering box out in the lobby area. And I want you to take that $5 and I want you to put it in there. Okay? Again, if, if you use it, spend it, that, that's your deal. This is your free resource. But I want you to take that $5. I want you to hold on to it if you can. But if not, invest it, whatever you want to do with it. But if you can, over the next two weeks, bring it back and put it in that box. You're going to be able to see the... the thing on there is going to probably say, hey, put your money here, put your five bucks here or something. But I want you to do that, all right? All right, do we have everybody? Everybody's got their five dollars. Okay, now let me tell you a, little, a couple things about this. You're probably thinking to yourself, this money is from the church. They're like, yeah, I think I gave 20 in 2022. I gave five dollars already. So, uh, I mean, technically I'm breaking even here, right? It's coming out of the church's account. I mean, I'm breaking even. This money is not from the church's bank account. This money came out of my bank account, okay? Uh, it came out of our savings. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, pastors, you know, they work one day a week and they make tons of money. We actually work two days a week, okay? <laughs> and, um, but, but financially, we don't make a whole lot of money. So this is coming out of our bank account. And today, based on the numbers we usually have here on a Sunday morning, um, we're probably going to give away about $1,500 out of our bank account, which is a pretty big portion for our family, okay? So that's why I'm asking you to bring it back because we'd like to feed our kids and to continue to, to survive. Now, there are some of you that um, um, you're kind of cynical and you're thinking, well, Chad, this is a good little scam. Because you're asking people to bring money back. People are going to feel sorry for you. And so they're not going to bring five back. They're going to bring like 10 or they're going to bring 100. And they're going to put it in there and you're going to be able to retire because they're going to give you so much money. Hey, cynical people, I'm way ahead of you, all right? So here's what I'm asking or here's what's going to happen. Uh, we just want to recoup our money back. That would be great. If more comes in, what we're going to do is use that money for grocery store buyout to help buy more food for more and more people in our community, okay? So there's something positive to this, right? So bring tons of money. I'll probably take a little cut because I'm doing this, you know, maybe 5% or something. I'm just kidding. Um, now, some of you also are thinking, hey, um, are you crazy? Like, why would you do this? And, and the smart ones are like, how did you get your wife to allow you to do that today? <laughs> And we had a really long conversation <laughs> this week about that. So she trusts me, and she's trusting you too, okay? And I promised her a whole lot if this works. Um, 
But the other part is, uh, for me, and this is what's so important here, I, I want us to kind of experience this change of perspective. Because honestly, when you got that $5, you, you were probably thinking, oh, this must come from the church. And it probably wasn't that big a deal. But now you know it, it's coming out of my pocket into your hands. I hope, unless you hate me <laughs> or my wife, which would be really weird because she's amazing, or both of us, <laughs> unless that's the case, like that changes your perspective on the money that's in your hand right now. And that's what I want to have happen. I want to change our perspective on how we view the money that we have. I, I, I want us to, to feel what it's like for God. When God says, hey, everything that you have, that is yours. And these are free resources that I'm giving you. But here's the deal. In the end, I actually own all of it. And, I, and I'm giving you this because I want you to use it wisely. I want you to invest it. I want you to use it to make a difference in the lives of others. But that will only happen when we change our perspective on money. And we understand it's not ours, it's God's. If we go back to the story, the power that's there in this changed perspective is really seen in what God does with it. When these servants realize, hey, this isn't ours, we need to use it, we need to invest it, we see what God does with that. God rewarded those who used it wisely. But I also want you to understand, God didn't say, hey, this is going to make your life easier. Right? It's kind of that prosperity gospel deal. Like, hey, you do this, and then you're going to get more money, and it's going to be great, and you can rest easy, and you can buy a G5, and you can do all these amazing things. That's not what God's saying here. It's not what Jesus is trying to teach. Jesus is saying, hey, here's the deal. Your life's not going to become easier all of a sudden because I might give you some more resources, whatever that may look like, to, to influence and, and, and impact more people's lives. God, God says here, this is not uh, about rest. Your reward isn't about rest, but more opportunities for bigger service for God. That's the reward in this. It's not so we can have more resources and more money and more possessions and so we can just kind of sit back and vacation all the time and say, hey, look what I did for God. No, we, we find these servants here, especially that, the servant who came back with a 1,000% return on investment. The king says, hey, I'm going to give you more. I, I want you to invest more. I want you to do more. I, I want you to continue to, to create and build this, this kingdom. And I believe that's exactly what God says to you and to me. These resources, they're yours. And I want you to take them and use them wisely. I want you to invest them. I want you to help build my kingdom here on this earth. That only happens if we begin to change our perspective when it comes to money. Let's pray. Let's pray.